This mega structure is about to become 9 million square feet of continuously connected interior space. Even now, it's well over a mile and a half to walk from one side over to the other. At this scale, internal transportation systems, emergency and utility systems, and tens of thousands of people work continuously to keep this indoor city alive. Miraculously, we are also witnessing its biggest expansion effort ever. The plan is to have this new concourse and its 19 additional gates open in 2028. But how could this enormous megastructure possibly keep growing? If you happen to catch one of the engineers or designers of the current O'Hare Airport expansion, they might speak about the complex as if it's like a living thing or displaying an organic character. The concourse is structured by a series of branching tree-like columns, an homage to the orchards that once stood on this land. That's because the individual systems work together and in isolation, much like an organism. Transportation is like circulation. An airport transit system, or an ATS, is the driverless train that shuttles passengers between terminals. You also have conveyors, carts, and the CTA, all within one big interior. Guided by underground communication and airways and satellite connection, the distributed command structure operates much like the chemicals of a mycelium network, a guy's movement and growth. That might sound silly or at best inconsequential, but hear me out because I think it's actually a key connection that might help solve some really practical problems in the future here. In O'Hare's early history, the branching structure has obvious parallels to a mycelium's branching pattern when it goes out searching for food. Then, as certain branches find more success than others, the network provides more resources to reinforce those pathways, which have proven can deliver more nutrients. So over time, multiple nodes form, each adjusting to environmental pressures like demand and congestion and land availability. These external factors come from the environment. So from an interior perspective, the organization could seem chaotic and illegible, but when read over time and from sufficient distance, the process is crystal clear, even if the form is not. This evolution then inevitably creates abandoned taxiways and rerouted service roads and inefficient or otherwise overly restrictive terminals that are incapable of handling the expected future conditions that it's going to encounter. Mycelium 2, it extends filaments in all directions, but then retracts inefficient pathways once resources are found. And all of that doesn't even get to the heart of its mission, taking in and releasing up to 900,000 flights per year from 100 gates on eight runways. Keeping this flowing requires its own control tower, traffic management, and ground vehicle fleets. Beneath and around the terminals lies a vast grid of infrastructure with its own central utility plants for heating and cooling, backup power generators for critical systems, water supply and wastewater treatment facilities, and even extensive fuel pipeline and storage farm to supply jet fuel. These systems are on par with what a medium-sized city might operate, only with a little bit more jet fuel. Also city-like are the dozens of restaurants, food courts, shops, and spa arranged like a giant shopping mall for travelers. There are VIP lounges, medical clinics, nursing rooms, and a chapel space a full-service hotel, police and fire departments on site, along with paramedics and an emergency response team responsible for the airport. Postal and cargo facilities form a logistics hub around the periphery. All these parts are about to be joined by many, many more. But what I think is so interesting about how this giant branched system of spaces grows is that it's almost impossible to think about this structure as having any kind of fixed shape anyway. It's constantly shifting and adapting. And this current incredibly ambitious spurt isn't just about adding more. It's also about scraping away the parts that are inefficient or otherwise restricting pathways forward. You might think of it like pruning, which includes assessing which parts are growing and which parts just aren't. The pruning, it considers the capacities of the environment, negotiating factors like restrictive boundaries or areas where growth just isn't possible anymore. However, at O'Hare, that boundary is already huge. The city of Chicago was able to arrange a series of land acquisitions during the 1950s, and it set it up for success. First was the gift of the Federal Airplane Manufacturing Facility, and that came with over a thousand acres. This area was originally known as Orchard Place, lending the airport its ORD code name. 
Then the city finagled another 1,000 acres from the U.S. government, and it either purchased or otherwise took more land until the airport reached 7,200 acres by 1959, an enormous site for the megastructure to develop within. Even so, planning a runway, it requires considering phenomena impacting much larger territories. This includes negotiating train winds that travel across the continent, geography, and watersheds. And if you're thinking a runway is just a glorified highway, think again. To support today's most massive aircraft, a runway has serious foundations into the earth, while the deck is a multi-foot thick layer cake of gravel and concrete. Laying one down, or worse, relocating one, means moving massive amounts of earth. 136 Olympic pools full just for a single runway. Anyway, by the 1960s, O'Hare became a major hub with six different runways. The terminals then were organized around a single spine with two 135-degree angle bends, each with branched networks of gates. One kink included the Seven Continents Rotunda as its centerpiece. In biology, there's this term. It's called canalization. It refers to a process that stabilizes an organism's development pathway against genetic or environmental disturbances, resulting in a more predictable and symmetrical final form. There's this preference towards symmetry, and when you find asymmetry, it's actually due to some strong external factors at play, compelling variation. And you can really see that playing out here. In the beginning, the airport encounters only a few obstacles. Sure, there's things like runways and having to negotiate some factors like trade winds, and that introduces a little bit of friction and a few deviations from perfect symmetry. But then, as it continues growing, certain pathways are reinforced while others encounter their limits, leading to uneven and unbalanced forms. So by the 1990s, those disruptions include the United Airlines, who reoriented their terminal parallel to the main spine. So now to get across to that satellite terminal, one has to traverse that 735-foot-long underground tunnel with those lights and undulating walls. You also get a new international terminal to the east, and this is pretty much the state that you find the airport in today, this asymmetric lump. Much less symmetrical than when we started. But the last few decades of stasis is pure deception, because not all the growth is perceptible to us civilians from the outside. So let's look underground and then upward from there to examine the role of each strata in the expanding interior metropolis. Deep underground, years before any work above ground could begin, the earth was being prepared with enormous tunnel boring machines. 40 feet below the surface, three storm water tunnels began boring. Two that are nine feet in diameter and 2,800 feet long, and one that is 14 and a half feet in diameter and about a mile and a half feet long. These are for the stormwater retention and runoff systems. They operate in concert with a basin and a 60-foot deep culvert that work in stages that kick into gear based on the scale of a storm event. And in the most extreme storms, the longest tunnel carries the water directly into the natural watershed. The system lies just below the rerouted utility tunnels. Electricity runs through almost the entire site, while buildings receive heated and chilled water from a central plant. These spaces also include communications fiber and service corridors for people to go and repair some of these systems, and they're reserved for foundation zones for future concourses and connector footings. Above this, the megastructure is growing a long pedestrian spine, and it is divided so that the traveling public and the employees can operate independently, you know, at their own pace. This is also where the luggage is routed through to the new terminals. Up just a bit, just below the surface level, the main lines carry jet fuel from the fuel farm to the hydrant mains that are under the apron that feed each gate. Which brings us to the surface level and the more visible and marketed areas of growth. Importantly though, we're not just witnessing additions at this level. Things like the runway reconfigurations are shifting from a chaotic, intersecting system to a parallel, modular structure. Fewer intersections means that there's less congestion and delay, you know, allowing for more freely flowing experience from the air to the gate. The terminals themselves then are shifting perpendicular to the runways, but parallel to one another. It's like this glitch or a mutation that just keeps on copying itself. Satellite terminals in general, I think, work well for airports because the gates can wrap on all sides while taxiing remains free-flowing. The concourses themselves then 
which sprout up above ground, often feature repeated patterns and like segmented rib-like forms. Not only is this like a typical structural solution, but the repetition helps save on cost and construction time. They recall the look of that original rotunda structure, I think, while either updating it or adapting it and stretching it out to these elongated forms. Miraculously, all this visible work, it won't impact operations during the 16 years that it's expected to take to implement all of this. And that means everything, the layers of extensions, the relocations and the rerouting of everything, like the runways, creeks, railroads, utilities, and parking are constantly being rearranged and adapted to maintain all of the function. And this is all controlled and planned through a wide-ranging set of political and infrastructural collaborations between the city and the airlines, the FAA, and regional facilities and agencies. Even architecturally, there's no single author in any one of these concourses, only a collective intelligence guiding growth and a decentralized adaptive organization. And while the airport is obviously driven to predict and encourage future growth, or at the very least daily, weekly, and seasonal cycles to determine its own staffing, mycelium too, it can begin anticipating regular environmental changes like cold cycles or dry cycles that might impact its intake and hunt for nutrients. Mycelial networks also expand through modular nodes that are each capable of acting semi-independently while maintaining connection to the overall collective. Similarly, O'Hare's terminal expansion and cargo zones and runways are built in modules that interlock and evolve without replacing the whole. The airport replicates parts of itself, spreading horizontally like a colony. The concourses then are like the parts that sprout up out of the earth for air, sunlight, and other nutrients. The mycelium or slime mold model of network simulations has been an important research for understanding how large-scale networks and human constructions work for, I think, a couple years now. Cities, subway networks, and airports, they not only look similar to the natural hierarchical structures of the fungi, they form like similar processes too. The airport though, I think feels a little bit unique because it's one single interconnected interior space. When we began, I said a walk from one end to the other is over a mile. But when all of this is finished, you'll be able to double that. Over those three miles or so, you'll be negotiating the entire gamut of conditions from jet fuel to stormwater runoff to restaurant waste. That slime mold model, whether it's run literally in a lab or just simulated in the computer, is useful for designers to understand the most efficient routes when contending with such complex forces that are coming at it from all scales. I mean, stuff like this are never really finished. They evolve over decades, and they continue to grow and change well beyond the current expansion plans. Even though the plans are vast in both time and in space, it's really the details that make projects like this work. And given your interests, I'm guessing that you're a detail-oriented person too. Maybe you check a half dozen reviews before making any of your purchases. You read nutritional information on cereal boxes. Or there was that one time that you even read the terms and conditions for an app that you almost downloaded. So when you're giving to charity, I suggest checking out GiveWell. It's an independent resource for rigorous, transparent research about great giving opportunities. The recent analysis of the effects of cash transfers in poor regions of Africa contains over 300 footnotes, which might satisfy even the most meticulous readers like you. GiveWell has spent 18 years researching global health and poverty alleviation and only directs funding to the highest impact opportunities that they've found. Over 150,000 donors have already trusted GiveWell to direct more than $2.5 billion. Rigorous evidence suggests that these donations will save over 300,000 lives and improve the lives of millions more through transformative projects like bed nets that prevent malaria, where only $6 can protect sleeping children and adults from contracting the disease from mosquitoes. You can find all of their research and recommendations on their site for free. And thanks to the donors who chose to sponsor their research, GiveWell doesn't take a cut from your tax-deductible donation to their recommended funds. If this is your first gift to GiveWell, you can have your donation matched up to $100 before the end of the year or as long as the matching funds exist. To claim your match, go to GiveWell.org and pick YouTube and enter Stuart Hicks at the checkout. Make sure that they know you heard about GiveWell from Stuart Hicks to get your donation matched. Again, that's GiveWell.org to donate or find out more. So, see you over there. And as always, thanks for watching.